One of the most important topics that we're grappling with this week is mental health. So I'm joined by four experts in the field here. I'll briefly introduce them. We have Ian Hickey, who is co-director of health and policy at the Brain and Mind Centre for the University of Sydney. Alicia London, chief executive officer of United for Global Mental Health. Anisha Padukone, who's director of the Live, Love, Laugh Foundation and Josh Gordon, who's director of the National Institute of Mental Health in the USA. So just to set the scene, we live in a world where there are 10,000 apps on our mobile phones to check uh, to help us monitor our behavior and support our mental health. And we're also living in a world where the average person in America checks their phone 80 times a day. So infinite distractions, which can, I think we'll all recognize, undermine our sense of well-being. So we're here to talk about some of the hazards and some of the hopes for technology and mental health. And to start with, I'd like everyone to share one optimistic view of the future. What happens if we get things right by 2030? And I'll just go along the panel. Well, we might have a worldwide mental health system that's actually fit for purpose. At the moment, we don't. It's discriminatory, it's exclusionary, in many parts of the world it doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So this is probably our best ever opportunity to build something that's fit for purpose. Thank you. I imagine a world where everybody everywhere has someone to turn to who can help them when their mental health is being challenged. Um, whether that's um, uh, someone online, whether that's someone in person, someone that is trained um, to give quality, humane support. Um, I believe we would have much better lives, families, businesses, and a world at large if that support was available. Thank you. I think for me it would be um, an ideal world where mental health is considered to be as important as physical health. Uh, so really creating an ecosystem where um, anyone suffering, uh, there's enough you know, therapists, there's enough psychiatrists, there's enough help available. Um, and also throw in the involvement of, you know, governments, uh, corporations, organizations. So really um, an ideal world where everybody recognizes the importance of it uh, and also uh, similar to what has happened with, with physical health, uh, you know, over the last 10, 15 years. So uh, I would echo the comments of my fellow panelists, but I would add in particular the role that technology can play in achieving this vision. I think technology has the capability to uh, facilitate better individualized uh, diagnostics in mental health, to enable the delivery of care to more people and more places than we can currently reach, um, and to facilitate destigmatization of mental illnesses because the delivery of better care, making available practitioners, connecting people to people will help uh, make mental illness a, um, a, 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 a make mental illness be seen without the same stigma uh, because it can be conquered. That point about stigma is a fascinating and maddening one. There's no stigma if you break your leg or if you're diagnosed with cancer. Why is there still stigma and is tech helping us overcome that stigma or is it in some ways reinforcing it? And that's an open question to anyone who'd like to jump in. When we talk about stigma, we're talking about um, knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and I think there's a lot of myths out there around what mental health or mental illness is and isn't. Um, and so in, I think the more we are educated ourselves and our own experiences um, and those around us of what this means, the more equipped we are to um, reach out for help when we need it. Um, I think also when we look globally, there's a... Um, Stigma is a challenge everywhere, but it's very context specific. Um, so there's not one solution um, as you look around the world. And, and technology can certainly help and is helping advocates and campaigners to reach and um, provide this information, provide opportunities to talk in context specific and safe ways. I think we need to unpack what are social attitudes mm. and beliefs. They are rapidly changing worldwide and have mm. shifted tremendously in the last two decades in most countries mm. in a very positive way. So in some ways, it's an old sort of discussion. The question is, do all of our other systems shift or is the discrimination actually still exists in the workplace, in the provision of healthcare, in the roles that you can take on in society so that actually the formal structures 
have not shifted as quickly as actually people's beliefs and attitudes, which have been strongly informed by information, by the sharing of lived experience, by those who have these problems, by the bravery of those who discuss their issues, and I think importantly, change the characterisation. You know, cancer used to be discriminated against. You know, I'm old enough to remember public health campaigns that cancer was a word, not a sentence. People did not come forward. We saw this with infectious diseases in the past. So I think actually there's been a big shift in those areas, but a lot of the barriers in many countries still sit 20 to 50 years behind and are really big issues that require active change in order to improve people's lives. If tackling, part of tackling stigma is openness, would anyone on the panel like to share some thoughts on their own experiences in this area? Sure. <laughs> um, very, I think it's really important that we do. Um, in 2013, I was running a successful charity, living a very full life, and had never struggled with my mental health. Um, never really thought about it, to be honest, and I think as many of us don't. Um, and I suffered a trauma, and uh, it turned my world upside down. Um, I, I hadn't built the resilience of, of how to handle this. Um, Well-meaning friends and family who love me, um, didn't quite know how to respond, and, and sometimes that made me worse. Um, but I was um, very, very lucky to have access to support and care. Um, and that ranged everything from friends and family who um, did understand and had maybe had been through it themselves. I think especially those that had suffered were those that were most equipped to be there. Um, and I'm grateful to them, and they saved my life. Um, but also having access to quality care. Um, having a great psychiatrist, medication when needed, um, having the choice to have that medication or not was really, I was very in a very, very privileged situation um, and, and a fabulous psychotherapist um, to go through that time. It's not something I ever thought that I would experience. Um, I think we often think about mental illness being someone else or, um, but actually we all have mental health mine got really unwell at a period of time and with the right support was able to recover. That is not the reality for the majority of the world. Um, and so whether it's tackling um, stigma and feeling safe to be able to reach out for that help, human rights abuses that so many people suffer. I think we've made a lot of progress in countries, like I was living in the US, I'm Australian, um, was able to afford care the reality for most of the world is that's not available um, and and even if it is the quality isn't there or there is you know, many do suffer very serious um, human rights abuses yeah thank you thanks for sharing that with us um, Anisha did you also want to jump in on that question yes actually so I come from the part of the world where uh, a lot of what you mentioned isn't available um, India is a country that is so far behind in its understanding of mental health uh, that conversations are not had uh, and that really uh, and the stigma that's associated with mental illness um, discourages someone suffering to actually speak out uh, let alone you know healthcare and, and affordability and, and things like um, getting help so um, uh, my sister actually uh, you know experienced anxiety and uh, depression and uh, she was one of the first uh, sort of um, known faces or celebrities in India to, to actually speak out on this. Um, and through that journey or process, she realized that uh, it's really important for India as a country um, to start that initiative or the journey. Uh, and that's how the foundation that we, you know, that we run, the Live Love Laugh Foundation was formed. So um, I think it's important uh, to also understand that um, globally the scenarios of mental health are very, very different. And uh, there's a large part of the world that, um, that really actually needs to start talking about this. Mm -hmm. And to give us more of a picture on the current state of play around the world, um, Alicia, could you share some statistics on mental health? Sure. Um, I think it's really important to start with, as I said earlier, we all have mental health, every single one of us. Um, and um, as you look around the world, um, this, this really is a crisis that our world is not set up for. So. Um, around 300 million people suffer from depression. Um, depression alone is expected to be the number one cause of disease by 2030. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people, age 15 to 30, which is actually the leading cause 
um, of illness and mortality for young women, teenage women. Um, I, I think these kind of shocking statistics that show this is a global issue, um, I think there are some really interesting um, uh, look into which governments are responding, who has national plans in place, who have up-to-date mental health policies. Um, th there are so many that are falling behind and, and the statistics around the lack of funding, both domestically, um, you know, often between one to five percent, sometimes higher, up to 10 percent, um, but on average of health budgets is spent um, vastly below where it should be. It should be around 5% in low-income countries at a minimum and 10% in high-income are far behind and um, quite a lack of global funding on this issue compared to other um, really important health issues as well. Thank you. And we're here to talk about technology, which surely will play a role in addressing those issues. Um, so I'd like to ask all the panellists to share one way technology can either help or harm our mental health, depending on who's feeling optimistic or not so much. Um, and I'm going to start with Josh, please, work. So work this uh, way. I'm going to start with a negative story and then move to a positive story. So um, and it, the, the negative story is a little bit less about technology and a little bit more about media, but it's a technology media delivery. So uh, as many of you may know, the Netflix came out with a, a, a television series that's streamed on video throughout the world, 13 Reasons Why depicts a, uh, a suicide by a teenager in uh, some detail. Researchers funded by my organization studied the impact in the United States of the release of that series on suicide rates in teenagers and showed that in the weeks and months after the release of the series, suicide rates in teenagers went up significantly. That's the uh, negative side. Um, the positive side is the um, social media response to that event was overwhelmingly positive when you analyze the interactions that teens had around 13 Reasons Why. And uh, so it may be that that social media response actually mm -hmm. dampened down what might have been a more significant increase in rates. So I think there's a potential for technology to be harmful, but I think there's even a, a greater potential if we knew how to use it properly for good. Fantastic. Thank you. Anisha? I think I would have to uh, agree with Josh. Um, I think it really depends on how you use technology. Uh, it really comes down to that. There are a lot of um, uh, positives and negatives. So, um, you know, addiction to technologies is a big problem. Um, there have been uh, certain platforms that have really um, affected the mental health of, of uh, the youth in India, for example. Um, I know the Blue Whale Challenge uh, quite recently... Uh, Sorry, for anyone who has never heard of a Blue Whale Challenge, this isn't, you know, it's not a biology project. Do you tell us more about what that actually was? Sure. So uh, the Blue Whale Project was actually um, uh, sort of like a game. Uh, it was um, uh, unfortunately started by people, miscreants, who really wanted to, to create trouble. Uh, and uh, for every level of the game, um, you know, it started off with uh, asking you to do a task on a particular day. So it could be as simple as, as um, you know, write something down on a piece of paper today. And it had different steps. Uh, and the last step was actually to commit suicide. So these were hackers who were looking to target a certain uh, age group or population. Uh, they got the children hooked on. Uh, young kids or young adults hooked on uh, based on certain demographic information that they had, uh, financial information that was used on, on platforms. And um, uh, so that led to a lot of suicides uh, across the world and especially in India. Um, I know we, uh, as an organization, we, you know, we did some uh, awareness around that, but uh, it became a national issue. Um, as well as, um, um, apart from that, there's also been, you know, large amounts of addiction to uh, certain um, uh, gaming platforms uh, where the government has actually had to step in and, and also regulate the use of it. So I think those are the negatives. Um, having said that, I think the positives uh, really come down to, you know, how you can better use technology for scale. Uh, technology to, you know, India is a really vast country, 1.3 billion people. Um, and 20% of those, you know, will suffer from depression in their lifetime. So how can you use technology to reach, you know, 
vast geographical locations, socioeconomic platforms. So there really is a good mix of both, uh, and it's important that we learn how to use it for better good. Thank you. I think the how technology or social media is used is the key point here. Um, we know that um, the 13 Reasons Why example doesn't have to be the case. Talking about suicide, it doesn't make people suicidal. <laughs> um, in, um, irresponsibly talking about it or using technology in the wrong way um, can have a really negative impact. And we know that. I think um, how technology can be helpful is when, to, I think, um, to your point, also on scale, um, two thirds of the world don't have access to any access to care, um, the kind that I had, what was available to me. So how can technology be used? And there are solutions that have been found to be really effective to provide that access. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to do that at scale and to do it ethically um, and um, effectively. Which of those apps are working and which ones aren't is, is a really key point that needs to be kind of looked at more fully. Um, but if technology can be used to, to provide that access, um, connecting with humans, um, not, not taking the humans out of the equation, which is so fundamental, then uh, we may be able to um, provide a lot more support to people who really need it. Thank you. Uh, I'm an unashamed optimist about this. <laughs> we have no other ways of actually reaching the world for one of the most important health issues that is out there. In fact, most people say it's the most important thing in their health and well-being is actually being in control mm. of their emotional and cognitive state. And then economically, it's the most important issue. It drives why you participate in employment, in education, mm. in your socially important roles. So there's this huge opportunity. And in a sense, the public discussion has been blown wide open. So we have a platform now where everyone can talk. So the problems and issues we're talking about where people didn't talk, now people are talking everywhere and they're talking to other people. So you see it's particularly in young people, it's the principal reason they talk online, they connect, they're sharing these particular issues. It causes parents and everyone else to panic. Mm. It causes the health system to totally panic. What are we going to do? Oh my God, if we talk about it, are we making it worse? We're actually just describing what is actually there. The challenge is to now design systems that respond appropriately, that support the community discourse, that allow the community to act in ways that are appropriate within their own local regional setting to do the, what is actually acceptable, but also useful and not do unuseful things or harmful mm. things. And in the health systems, this is a really big opportunity. We're really lucky in mental health. We are not so dependent on hospitals and operating theatres and physical infrastructure. We can reach and share specialisation right around the world in a way that we had never had the opportunity. So the challenge, I think, is with us. How do we do it smart? to seize the power of this technology to do something really important socially, healthily, but also economically, productivity-wise, that really matters in all countries. Mm -hmm. anyway, clearly there are risks along the way, and we, they, I think, are overemphasised every day in the media. So this is related to bullying, this is related to showing harm, this is sharing harmful content. You would think that is the only thing that's going on. If you actually look what is going on, it's people sharing stories, seeking information, those in trouble reaching out, trying to find people like themselves who they would not have been able to connect to, and actually sharing things in a way, in a non-judgmental, open way, that is often not the case mm. in the systems they're actually in. So, you know, one of the issues I'd make a plea for is trying to get the balance right. Sure, there are harms. Sure, it can go wrong. But right at the moment, most people are using it in a positive way. The challenge is, how do we understand that? It's happening in real time. And the technology itself changes so quickly. And the way that people use that technology changes so quickly. We're struggling to just keep up with it. I think that's such an important point, because the reality is we've got globally a healthcare system where lots of people don't have access to even the most basic mental health. We don't want care. basic. We want high quality. So the whole idea in developing low and middle countries, you only get basic. It's a terrible idea. Yeah. Here's an area of healthcare where we should have the worldwide aspiration that everyone gets quality care. You know, we've Actually, had examples, we've... for example, in South America and other places, you can get quality care, and in our developed countries, people do not get quality care a lot of the time. So this is a you know, real opportunity for all of us. What are the tech hacks? What, can, what are the secrets to providing that quality care for everyone? Could you share some ideas that are working? So we've got a number of research projects around the globe that are doing this in, in low and high resource settings. In Pakistan, there's researchers who are developing a system to use iPads to diagnose autism. And that's a case where, you know, you, that's not the basic mm. mental health care. This is trying to provide really excellent quality care, early intervention for neurodevelopmental disorders. 
Uh, there's a, a, a number of researchers and clinicians in a community in, in a small city in Colombia that is using electronic health records to develop a learning healthcare system in individualized personalized medicine. You've got text messaging based support for uh, individuals to ensure they get appropriate mental health care and physical health care integrated uh, in rural areas in Western Kenya. So all around the globe, there are incredible hacks. And what we see, you know, I oversee research around the globe, but mostly in the United States, we see the most creative stuff happening in these low resource settings because they need it and because they're not hobbled by the presence of a, of a, a system which is uh, in place and, and not providing quality care. I think just another thing you, you touched on there that is so powerful with tech is providing data, good quality, real-time data that we just haven't had on mental health at scale around the world. Um, Crisis Text Line in the US and it's growing around the world shows real-time, like what times of the day are people reaching out to talk about self-harm? What times of day are they talking and really struggling with depression? Like we have access through technology and better data now than ever before to help inform um, at scale solutions as well. And I think harnessing that as we move forward is going to be really important. I think I think it empowers people in healthcare systems. So people with mental health problems and their families have typically been disempowered. This is a way they can interact. So I think in Australia we've been very lucky to have big Australian government support to get smart healthcare systems. So not about the 10,000 apps, but actually smart healthcare systems mm. where people can put information in that's highly personalised and get back smart information and be real partners in care for longer term outcomes and that's really transformative. We have a terrible history of low quality care in mental health through underinvestment and through societal attitudes. Here's a big opportunity to do it differently. Anisha, any thoughts on how this is playing out in India? So I think um, even though there's a, there's a sort of general uh, lack of awareness and, and very high levels of stigma, uh, the number of tech platforms that are providing support uh, have increased in the last three or four years, uh, but I would have to say that the, um, we're not sure about the quality of, of that. Uh, so one is while you provide the access, you also have to uh, be responsible about the quality of service that you're providing. Um, so I think, um, you know, we're at a very nascent stage and while we grow, uh, technology is something that will that'll really play an important role. Um, but yes, quality is something that we need to be aware of. Final question from my side. For me, this has been a very novel half hour for a variety of reasons, one of which I've not looked at my phone once, and neither has anyone else on the panel, I'm relieved to say. Um, how do you manage technology in your own lives? Are we at a point where many people are genuinely addicted to technology? And is addiction even a helpful concept? Anyone who wants to jump in? Can I say I don't like the addiction word? And I think it's a danger. It's a behaviour. It's a social behaviour we're all engaged in that's more in response to different sort of social inputs. At the moment, we love it. We can stay connected. We do sorts of things, which is why it dominates kind of situations. It clearly interferes in a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. If, every, if we were all sitting here playing with the phone instead of talking to you, it wouldn't really work. So I think we're, you know, we're learning new ways kind of about that. And there are, it's causing social challenges. And there are really big issues with younger people about the social moderation of that, that we're still learning out the best way to actually come to terms with. But, you know, the connection, you know, if I go and look for my, stay in contact with my children and speak to my grandchildren today and do that several times, I'm not sure I'm addicted to it. I kind of like that, you know? So the, the, the sense that we can be here, but we can also be globally connected is very powerful. And that for humans, that's very reinforcing. That's what we like to do. Um, I love disconnecting from my phone. Um, and I also love spending time on it. The thing um, very particular to me that I love most about it is we are connected with advocates, mental health campaigners around the world that have been kind of often doing this by themselves, fighting for change um, through the Speak Your Mind campaign. It's in 15 countries and now we're connected. And I think there's going to be great power that comes from people being connected who are passionate about this issue to take it forward. And technology, again, how do we harness it for good? It is. Um, it makes initiatives, global conversations like this possible. So I think personally for me, uh, I like to find a good balance between uh, staying connected, like Ian said, to family and friends um, in various parts of the world. Um, so that, that is you know, something that I, I usually like to do, but, but I also like to uh, ensure that I disconnect. Uh, and I think anyone who knows me well uh, or who tries to reach out to me knows that there will be certain points of time where I'm not 
uh, necessarily on my phone all the time. I don't like having it, you know, next to me all the time because then the tendency is to to pick it up and look at it. Um, so for me, the keyword would have to be balance. Thank you. I'm terrible at that balance. <laughs> the best that I can say is I have two phones, one for work and one for uh, personal, because my uh, as a government employee, I have to use the separate phones for those two things. And at least I put the work phone down on weekends. So that's about the best I can say on that subject. Thanks ever so much. And now, uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I said I live in Singapore and I uh, come from a region where cell, cell phone and smartphone penetration is uh, growing by leaps and bounds, latest being uh, Myanmar. Uh, now, the kind of uh, issues that crop up with this uh, uh, are many. I just want to know, is there some way that telemedicine can help in, uh, uh, in checking some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the more egregious uh, 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 adverse impacts uh, of uh, the, uh, you know, proliferation of smartphones and people's addic you said you didn't like the word addiction, but... Uh, well, there's behaviours. Yeah. So pick up your point. Things like people's sleep-wake cycle, their activity cycle, the same time that these things are going out, they actually are providing information back. So we actually can see whether utilisation is disrupting, for example, the sleep-wake cycle of younger people or making them less active and spending more screen time. So we will get information back. The issue is whether we, what we then do about it, which is a collective social one, you know. Right. Parents, quite hard to get the phone off the kid at night, you know, so they might sleep properly and, you know, those sort of things. We're going to have to take social responses, but we will have essentially environmental surveillance. We'll know what is going on mm -hmm. as a consequence of where those phones go. Yep. They're out there in real people's worlds. Yeah. So can we use uh, things like uh, telemedicine to, uh, you know, in uh, India, for instance, there's a uh, big use of uh, 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 telemedicine, right? I mean, starting from radi radiological um, interpretations to a whole lot of other things. Can that be used to mitigate some of the adverse effects of uh, what we just discussed? So first, I want to contend some of the adverse effects. Okay. We don't have measurements of many of those adverse, uh, adverse effects. Uh, but the answer to both that aspect of the question is, are there adverse effects? And then the other part of it is, can we use smartphones and telemedicine to actually help with that? Lies in the fact that we just need better and more studies. We have 10,000 apps. Less than a handful have undergone rigorous testing for efficacy. Less than a handful are used more than for a week, <laughs> right? So we need better uh, evaluation, better testing of both the uses of the data that we get in and the um, uses of the therapeutic approaches and diagnostic approaches that we use these apps for so that we can enhance mental health using technology. Many thanks. Any more questions? It's something that you haven't really addressed, but really concerns me. Um, it was an interesting point that came up. Uh, what is the cost of not taking care of mental health? And the answer to that was, well, what does being well in mental health actually mean? So you can tell when someone's leg has been healed. You can tell when cancer has been cured or not cured, and there's a cost. But what does it mean to be well in mental health? And it's so culturally dependent, and one of the biggest fears that I have around this whole digital thing is that much of the disconnect has to do with a social issue, and a cultural issue, and we're dealing with transitions. And you're talking about apps that are available to people. Um, how do we know that they're appropriate for that cultural context? I mean, let's just talk about a girl who's just had an abortion, just been shunned by her family. Now, what does she do? <laughs> it's a, how, how do we deal with the cultural context which is often at the root of the mental problem. I think the first answer is say these solutions, um, these initiatives have to be driven by those in that know their country. Um, we can learn from each other globally, but um, in everything we do, this has to be something that's homegrown. 
um, and and we're seeing solutions like that working around the world. Um, so I think there's a couple of different points to your question there. I think that's the first thing. I think what does this look like to be well? I really like the idea of fulfilling our potential. Um, some people may live with a mental health condition. Um, you can still reach your fullest potential um, with the right support. Some like myself may go through a trauma and recover um, and still struggle from time to time, but um, it's not being held back. Um, it's buying and, and it's using the different tools that we have available to, to make that possible. Um, and, and I think it's about saying, how can technology help effectively in those environments um, and, and making sure that every country, um, every, um, and really looking at a country level right down to a community level has the right tools to make the decisions and access to the things that will help them. Many thanks, sorry, we're, we're running short on time, but just that measurement just one. I want to really contend the measurement one. When people say they can't see it, they don't know. Lots of work has been done in low income countries, high income countries. We do know when those people who are close to us can't go to work, withdraw, behave oddly, are disturbed from their normal self. In fact, whether we, we just have trouble talking about it, but recording it is not that complicated. So being well enough to participate, just like with other physical health problems, the productivity side of that is actually probably the hardest measure, but the one we all aspire to, despite whatever other problems we have, we want to be able to participate. We want to be able to go to work, we want to be able to go to school, we want to be able to thrive. So in the, in the Australian National Mental Health Commission I've been a part, we use two concepts, a contributing life and a thriving community. And they are social and contracts, but they're hard, they're hard measures, they're not soft measures. And that's what we've got to be aiming for, not just a little bit of mental health care that makes you a little less distressed, but actually sufficient that allows you to participate. And that's where these enormous productivity gains have been spoken about. So I think we've got to contest that first bit. What that means and how we do it in different cultural settings and do it appropriately in different cultural settings, that's a bigger challenge. Many thanks. And finally, one last question. Millennials and generations that are frequently accused of being sensitive, everyone seems to have anxiety these days. Is that a fair assessment or do we finally have the language and the platforms to talk about what's going on with our mental health? That's a great question. I think there's some evidence for both. I think there's some evidence, at least in the US, for uh, slowly rising rates in anxiety in adolescents. There's certainly evidence for rising rates of suicide deaths in adolescence in the, in the United States and I think in many countries globally. Um, but I think you're right also, there's considerable evidence that young people are much more willing to talk about it and to use that language and to seek help for it. So I think it's probably a combination. Right. Thanks so much for the panelists. Thank you for joining. If you're watching online, you'll be able to play this video back soon.